Okay. Today is our ninth week in Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. And wow, what a blessing it has been to journey through this book. Amen? Typically, that's kind of how we do things here at Rooted Fellowship. Uh, typically, we preach through entire books of the Bible, going through them line by line. And last week, Pastor Stephen uh, did such a great job in unpacking for us Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 to 21. And, and remember, he reminded us to wake up, wake up to who we are in Christ, and thus how we ought to live our lives. Now, family, you may recall that throughout this sermon series, we have been saying that the book of Ephesians, it kind of has like two parts, okay? It has two parts. The first part, which is found in Ephesians chapters 1 to 3, uh, reminds us about who we are in Christ, uh, and Paul beautifully tells the roots, the roots or the story of the gospel, the gospel, that all people born into this fallen, sinful world have fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and that we are in desperate need of a Savior. Paul then told us that that Savior has, however, come. His name is Jesus, God the Son. He lived the perfect sinless life. He died an all-sufficient death. He rose from the grave, defeating sin and death. He ascended to be with God the Father in heaven. He sent us God the Holy Spirit to empower us, to equip us, to to make followers of him. And family, he's coming back soon to make all things new. Amen? Paul also reminded us that through this gospel-saving work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, followers of Jesus or Christians are now united into one body, the church. That's who we are in Christ. That is who we are in Christ. And then in the second part of the book of Ephesians, Paul double clicks on the fruit, the fruit or the implications of who Christians are in Christ. From chapters four onwards, he speaks about how we ought to walk and live in light of who we are in Christ how we are to be children of the light, God's manifold wisdom on display. And that's exactly what Pastor Stephen woke us up to last week, reminding us to bring our faith, our Christian walk, in fact, our entire lives in line with who we are in Christ, by being continually led by God's Holy Spirit as we seek to be God's new community on display. And so after that section, In chapter 5, we now come to this section, which I'm going to be dealing with today, in the book of Ephesians, where Paul gets super specific, okay? He gets super specific. Um, We've identified who we are in Christ. We've seen how we should live. And now Paul gets, I want to call it fine tooth comb specific about exactly where, where we should be living out our faith. And so here, towards the end of chapter 5, And at the beginning of chapter 6, Paul deals with three specific relationships, okay? He addresses three specific relationships where Christians are called to live out their faith. How we are called to imitate Christ. You remember this from Ephesians 5 verse 1. We are called to imitate Christ and how these three relationships are meant to reflect the beautiful gospel picture between Jesus Christ and his church. In the following verses, Paul begins to focus on the context of the household, the household, because the basic, the the, the Christian household was the basic expression of Christian community, okay? So he focuses on the household because the household is the basic expression of Christian community. So this morning, I'm going to be dealing with two of those three relationships. I've spoken about three. This morning, I'm going to deal with three, uh, two of those three as I dig into Ephesians 6. Okay, so I'm going to kind of leapfrog and go to Ephesians 6. Um, I'm going to be dealing with two of those three relationships that we see in in this text as I dig into Ephesians 6. But let what I've just shared serve somewhat of as a trailer attraction for what is coming next week, because next week we have something super excited planned. I see that I say that a lot. I said it earlier about the 17th. I'm saying it again. Uh, Next week, Pastor One is going to be taking us through the marriage relationship, which Paul deals with in chapter 5, 
verses 22 to 33. So, and so Pastor Ono, he's going to come back and finish up Ephesians 5 as he preaches on marriage next week. And so family, that means that we can prepare to dive into our text in Ephesians 6 today. And we're going to be checking out Ephesians 6 verses 1 to 9. However, before we read this text, before we dive in, I think it's crucially important for us to take note of something. You're going to see in a minute that in verses 5 to 9, Paul speaks about slaves and masters. Okay, in, Paul, in verses 5 to 9, he addresses slaves and masters. However, family, it's vitally important to note that whilst Paul acknowledges that this relationship existed, and the fact that it was going on in first century Ephesus, Paul does not condone slavery. In fact, Scripture, Jesus Christ, and the Apostle Paul are very much against slavery. So what's up with slavery in the Bible, you say? People often want to know if the Bible condones slavery. Well, as we read in the text this morning, you may ask yourself, why doesn't Paul come out and outlaw or abolish this injustice? And so people ask, is Paul condoning slavery in our text today? The answer is no, and neither does the rest of the Bible. How do we know that? Well, the Bible says that God's people are to love our neighbors. Family, you cannot own, you cannot own a possession and love that possession. You cannot love a person and own them as your possession. We are to treat others as we would want to be treated. We saw this last year as a church when we went through Mark's gospel. And Jesus says in Mark 12, verse 31, he says, love your neighbor as yourself, which forms part of the great commandment. Owning someone is not loving them. But we don't just see this in the New Testament. Slavery and slave masters are never viewed or described in a good way in the whole of scripture. Slavery is present in all throughout the scripture as a symptom of this broken and sinful world. In Exodus, the nation of Israel is in slavery under Pharaoh and the Egyptians. They are not viewed positively. In fact, God comes and redeems the nation of Israel out of that very slavery. We saw that in our previous series in the book of Exodus. In fact, even in Genesis, Joseph was a slave, Daniel was a slave, and never is slavery ever viewed positively in the scriptures. And as Christians, we know that one of the pictures of the gospel is freedom from slavery. Oh yes, slavery to sin, but slavery nonetheless. Christianity is a freeing the captive's faith, amen? We have been freed, and so we long to see others set free and liberated from the way that sin enslaves and binds us. And so the Apostle Paul here in our text today, and in other texts, most definitely undermines the worldly system of slavery. In 1 Timothy 1.10, Paul calls out human trafficking as a sin because he says slave traders break the commandment prohibiting stealing. Slavery is stealing. It is stealing opportunities, freedom, dignity, and choice amongst many, many other things. In Galatians, Paul teaches about the equality of individuals, which was completely revolutionary in the first century. And in Galatians 3, verse 23, he says that there is absolutely no difference in status between believers in Jesus, but instead we are all equal before Christ. We are equal before Christ. We are all one in Christ. Amen? Paul even tells believers in Corinth, in his first letter to the Corinthians, he says to the slaves amongst those believers that if they are able to obtain their freedom, then they should. If they're able to obtain their freedom, then they should. But family, I think the most remarkable book in the Bible that addresses slavery is the book of Philemon. In this book, there's a slave named Onesimus. And he's run away. He meets Paul, becomes a Christian. And then Paul then sends him back to Philemon and tells Philemon to receive him back no longer as Philemon's slave, but instead as a brother. As a brother. And so with all of that being said, we come to chapter 6, verses 1 to 9 of Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. And I'm going to be reading from the Christian Standard Bible, or the CSB. That's Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 9 in the CSB. You can follow along in your Bible, uh, and it'll be up on the screen. Uh, and family, I think let's stand for the reading of God's Word this morning. Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 9. 
Children, obey your parents in the Lord, because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may have a long life in the land. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart, as you would Christ. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing God's will from your heart. Serve with a good attitude as to the Lord and not to people knowing that whatever good each one does, slave or free, he will receive this back from the Lord. And masters, treat your slaves the same way, without threatening them, because you know that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. This is the word of the Lord, and so thanks be to God. I invite you to have a seat, and uh, I'm going to pray for us before we get into the preaching of God's word. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this morning acknowledging you, Lord God, as the perfect Father. Thank you that you are our perfect Father. We come before you acknowledging you, Jesus, as our perfect Lord and Savior. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come now and lead us, lead us in the, this time. Would you come, Lord God, and lead me as I pre preach your word? Would you use me, Lord God? I pray, Lord God, for everyone here. I pray that we would be open to what you would have us here. Lord God, bring your truth, bring hope, bring guidance, bring light, bring hope. Lead us deeper into a relationship with you. Lead us closer into relationships with others. May we be moved as we prepare to head out into this, wor uh, this, this world this week, Lord God. May this, this scripture strengthen, strengthen us, equip us to be your people on mission. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Okay. <coughs> so family, after reading this word, it's important to note that the key element in making a Christian household thrive is for the participants to, in all things, follow Christ's example, right? To make a Christian household thrive is for participants in all things to follow Christ's example. Somebody say, follow Jesus. I think everyone can say, follow Jesus. If you take one thing home today, it's that. Follow Jesus, right? Be Jesus wherever you are. Now, if you're not a parent or a caregiver, you may be tempted to check out for the next four or so verses. Check back in at verse five, right? I'm noticing at this gathering, we have kind of maybe less, less parents with young kids. So you may be tempted to do that. But actually, no. We don't have that option. Because you see, we have seen that as believers, we are one in Christ, right? And so if we are one in Christ, what is my brothers and sisters is also mine. And so family, the children in families that are part of the church here at Rooted Fellowship, well, they are also part of our collective responsibility here at Rooted Fellowship. It's not just Teacher Kirsty, Teacher Jose, Teacher Tiamo. It's not just their responsibility, but it is everybody's responsibility to look out for the kids within our church family. The men of our church are called to be spiritual fathers to the young children at Rooted. Amen? The women of our church are called to be spiritual mothers to the young children at Rooted Fellowship. Amen? Perhaps you're a younger child. I don't see any younger children here today, no. But if you were, if there were children here, I would say, maybe you're sitting here, or maybe as you reflect on your own childhood, you may reflect on a strained relationship with a parent. Maybe you lost a parent when you were younger. Um, maybe both of them passed away. To those folks, I say, just as Jesus said to his followers, here are your mothers and fathers. Here are your brothers and sisters. The church family is our family. It is the family of God. And so, folks, these words apply as much to all of us as they do to the parents and caregivers amongst us. And so from now on, when I use the words parents, if you're a Christian, uh, raising children in some shape or form, or if you're a fellow brother or sister at Root of Fellowship, well, then these words apply to us all. You see, because as Paul writes these words, he has the Christian family, the church, specifically in mind. He is writing to Christian households in Ephesus, after all. And then, 
kids, as we reflect maybe back on our own childhoods, we're going to see from our text today that the expectations that children have from their parents, they can make of us as parents within their church. We should be aware of the expectations of the children of Roots of Fellowship as we come to this text. And so we come to verse 1. Children, children, obey your parents in the Lord because this is right. Obey your parents in the Lord because this is right. Now, it's important to note here that Paul is specifically addressing kind of younger children who are still dependent on their parents. And so clearly this means that younger children form part of the Christian worship gathering, right? They were there where God's word was read, preached, and taught, and where they worshiped God together as a family. In fact, Paul even takes it for granted that these younger children would be present in these gatherings because they too belong to the, ch- the Christian family or the church. What's amazing about this verse is that here we have this the, the, the less privileged or the subordinate group in society, namely young children, they are being given priority recognition, right? Paul addresses children first. And this was completely countercultural to the first century Ephesians. It's still very countercultural today, if we're honest. Social distinctions rigidly observed in the first century Roman Empire and even in Judaism and even in Pretoria today require that we greet parents and then we greet their vulnerable younger children. But this practice is completely transformed by the gospel here. Family, from this verse, we can clearly see that young children are to form part of a local church's corporate worship and that they are to participate in those gatherings and be formally recognized and addressed. Recognized and addressed and participate in our family gatherings. It's one of the many reasons that I love how we do things here at Rooted Fellowship at this local church. Here at Rooted, we partner with parents in the discipling of their children. We partner with parents and caregivers in the discipling of their children. We don't offer child care or Sunday school um, whilst parents go up to big church, right? We don't do that. We don't kind of offer that Sunday school church, uh, children's church um, caregiver package while people go for a two-hour coffee break. No, no, no. It is also one of the reasons that when kids are old enough to join this gathering, we invite them in to do so at a fairly young age by other uh, people's standards. And we are looking forward to the day when COVID protocols allow us once again to invite and include the children of our church into the larger corporate gathering for praise and worship. In our previous uh, venue, we used to get together as a church and there were kids and it was amazing. Amen? Yeah. And why do we do that? Why did we do that? Because we want them to know that we are indeed one body and that they have a unique role to play in that. It's also for this very reason that we started family groups for families with younger children which meet on Friday nights. Because corporate family groups are not meant to just cater for parents and caregivers. No. What a joy it has been to see the children within family groups become such close friends and to hear stories about how these kids look forward to Friday night family groups. And I've even heard that sometimes they even look even more forward than the parents do. Family, as we seek to thrive at our Sunday gatherings and at our midweek city groups or family groups, it's crucial that the children of our church play their part and find their place in all of that. But now that Paul has addressed these younger children, what does he then say? Well, he instructs them to remain obedient and to listen to the advice of their parents. And we've seen that throughout Scripture, right? This is not new. Isaac's willingness to be offered as Abraham's sacrifice in the book of Genesis is an example of such submission. And in 2 Timothy 3, verse 2, we see that disobedience to parents is a, is a symptom of a disintegrating social structure. And so it's clear that Christian families and communities have a responsibility to not contribute to the collapse of a community. The great parenting manual, the book of Proverbs, uh, in Proverbs 15.5 says, A fool spurns a parent's discipline, but whoever heeds correction shows prudence. But what does Paul say when he says in verse 1, Obey your parents in the Lord? What does he mean when he says that? Obey your parents in the Lord. Well, it means that young children 
are not to, they're not only to simply follow Jesus' example, but they are also to realize that both them and their parents are under the authority of the living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul then even describes this as being the right thing for young children to do, Colossians 3, verse 20. Then we move on to verses 2 and 3 of our text today, Ephesians 6, verses 2 and 3. Paul here now refers back to the fifth commandment found in Exodus 20, verse 12, and Deuteronomy 5, verse 16. When he, he, he also says today, he says, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. It's the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. Family, these two verses now apply not just to the younger dependent children within the the Christian gathering, but these two verses actually apply to all of us believers. Okay? Remember, Paul is addressing Christian households. Now, no matter how old we are, we are to honor our parents and elders. It's interesting to note that the fifth commandment is the first one that has a promise attached to it. Essentially saying that it is wise to honor your parents and elders, and that such wise living leads to long life. We see this in Exodus, Deuteronomy, Proverbs, and now here in Ephesians. Honoring our parents and elders leads to a long life. But for Christians, this long life that Paul is referring to is not the promised land in Canaan, no. It is rather eternity spent with the Lord our God. Amen? Family, on this continent, we are so blessed and privileged to be surrounded by cultures that really honor our elders. These cultures cherish elders' wisdom. They defer to their authority, and they pay real attention to their comfort and happiness. And this ties in beautifully with how we are to live as Christians, seeking to love and serve others. However, family, let's not misunderstand honor for blindly follow, okay? We mustn't misunderstand honor for blindly follow. Brothers and sisters, we are not called to do anything sinful or to cover up sin and injustice, even if our parents, caregivers, or elders tell us to. We are not called to do anything sinful or to cover up sin and injustice, even if our parents, caregivers, or elders tell us to. In such a case, we are called to rather obey God, our perfect Father. We see this in Acts 5.29, where Peter and the apostles say to the council, trialing them, they say, we must obey God rather than any human authority. There is a difference between blindly obeying and honoring. Obeying means to follow what one is told, but to honor means to love. To love. Children are never commanded to disobey God whilst obeying our parents. We are never commanded to disobey God whilst obeying our parents. Children are not called to be subservient to abusive or domineering elders and parents. But we are called to love them. We are called to love them. And family, in some situations, love may require us to set healthy boundaries, to limit contact, or even to cut ties. If you're struggling with a toxic or difficult relationship with your parents or elders, I would encourage you and urge you to reach out to our brother or sister in the Lord, to invite them into, to pray with you, and to help you navigate what obeying Christ and honoring your parents may look like in your particular situation. Especially in a situation that may be toxic, may be unhealthy, or feel overwhelming. Reach out. We come to verse 4. Verse 4 says, Fathers, fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So in Ephesians 6 verse 1, Paul addresses parents, fathers and mothers, spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers, whereas here he specifically only mentions fathers. Why is this the case? Okay. Well, Paul now turns his attention to the heads of the households, he addresses them, which of course the church recognized as the fathers. And so here Paul is addressing them as the representatives of the family. But he is also very much speaking about the duties of Christian parents, okay? And he's speaking about the duties of the spiritual parents as well. So we need to remember this. The child-parent relationship is not one-sided, okay? A standard feature of Paul's treatment of these household relationships is that the stronger 
have obligations to the more vulnerable. I'll say that again. The stronger have obligations to the more vulnerable. The gospel introduces a completely fresh element into parenting by insisting that the child must be considered. And in a society where a father's authority was absolute, this was totally, totally revolutionary. Christian parents are to bring up their children in the training and instruction of the Lord. A parent's role is to model obedience to God, the Father, as Christ did, and then to teach this to their children, to follow Jesus and to teach that to their children, so that when their children grow up, they in turn will know what it looks like to obey God. But together with teaching children obedience, parents are also called to be loving and tender toward their children as they treat their children justly. Christian parents are called not to anger or exasperate their children, which means that they must not needlessly punish or rebuke them. Discipline needs to be consistent, and they must not place unnecessary hardships on their children. Parents are called not to make their children angry without cause, and discipline should only be done in a loving way that ensures a child's future welfare. Discipline is to be done in a loving way that ensures a child's future welfare. Discipline should not be overly severe, and Christian parents need to be careful not to grieve or harden the tender hearts of children. Discipline should never come from a place of impatience because we Christians are called to be long-suffering. And they need to remember that the authority given to them by God is to be used only, only for the benefit and the encouragement of their children. Family parental discipline is to help children grow, to help them grow, and not to discourage them. I think it goes without saying that parenting is not easy, okay? Parenting is not easy. It takes a lot of patience to raise children in a consistently loving, God-honoring manner. But I'm sure that the very best of y'all uh, get frustrated. I'm sure that, that, that parents in the house do, parents and caregivers. But we are called to act in love, to treat children as Jesus treats those whom he loves, to follow Jesus. Treat children as Jesus treats those whom he loves. Because this is vital to a child's development as well, because they learn what Jesus is like from their parents, their caregivers, their spiritual mothers, and their spiritual fathers. Christian children should learn grace and forgiveness from their parents and the church family. They should not learn a type of moralistic pride which berates and puts down others when they fail, when they sin, or when they struggle. And so family of God here today, I ask us, how are we disciplining the children of our church, the children in our care? Parents, caregivers, spiritual mothers and fathers, how are we disciplining the children of our church and in our care? As they watch us, do they see humble obedience in action? Do we model confession and repentance and forgiveness to them? Do we apologize to our children when we get things wrong, no matter how young they are? How do we respond to failure and disappointment when we are in front of children? How do we deal with their failures and their mistakes? Are our homes places filled with fear or forgiveness? How do we deal constructively with our anger when they're around? And if they looked at us, would they see Jesus? I'm going to conclude this section with this. We've seen that both parents and children have a responsibility to one another. Okay, Parents, children, they both have a responsibility to one another. Children are called to honor their parents and parents are called to gently care for their children. But family, this will only happen in a Christian household when both children and parents emulate Christ in love. Emulate Christ in love. We then come to verses 5 to 9, next section of Ephesians 6. We come to that second relationship. But before we get into a deep dive of these verses, we need to examine kind of what was going on around these verses. Okay? So contextually, what was going on? You see, Paul is still concerned with the Christian household, 
Okay, so we're still dealing with households because the majority of slaves in first century Ephesus were employed within the home. They were employed within the home. One Bible scholar says that it was estimated that at this time that there were over 60 million slaves across the Roman Empire, which is about roughly a third of the population. And many of these people were becoming Christians. Okay, they're becoming Christians. Of course, most would have been in the employment of Greco-Roman worshipping uh, households or pagan worshipping households, but a few would have been in the employment of Christian households as Christianity began to sweep across the entire Roman Empire. We're also going to see in a minute that Paul addresses these Christian servants on an equal standing with their household heads, whether their masters were Christian or not. Christian, uh, uh, Paul addresses these Christian servants on an equal standing with their masters, whether their masters were Christians or not. And he acknowledges their work with respect and dignity. Now, in a society that regarded these people as no more than living tools, Paul's words once again represent a counter-cultural view. It's also important to note that in these verses, or in the verses preceding these verses, uh, when Paul deals with marriage and children, he kind of views marriage and parenting as divine relationships, but he does not make the same claim to be, to be the case for the institution of slavery. Okay, So he sees parenting and children and marriage as something appointed by God, but he does not make that claim for slavery. Now remember, it's important to say this again, that Paul here is writing about an existing social structure, but in other letters, we see him calling out slavery as a sin. Okay. So we come to verse 5. Remember, here Paul is addressing Christian slaves in the churches in Ephesus, some of whom were in the employment of Christian households, others of whom were not. Verse 5. Slaves, obey your masters with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as you would Christ. Here, Paul acknowledges a change for those slaves in first century AD who may have come to faith in Christ. He does something. Okay, he acknowledges a change for them. And in addition to all the wonderful, unspeakable blessings of being freed from the power of sin and being made right with God and empowered by the Holy Spirit, Paul also reminds them that these slaves, they have a new, perfect, heavenly authority. And so he relegates their human masters because of their ha loving, heavenly Lord to whom they now owe their supreme allegiance to. And by reminding them of this, they are then able to go about their work knowing that they are free in the Lord. Amen? And when Paul says with fear and trembling in this verse, when he says with fear and trembling, we must not confuse this fear with uh, in the sense that like one is scared or of making a small mistake. That's not what he's saying here. Instead, these workers were to sincerely work well as their expression of their commitment to their divine Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what he's calling them to. Paul calls them to work as if they were working for Jesus. And friends and family, who was Jesus? Jesus was patient. Jesus was kind. Jesus was forgiving. Jesus was patient. He was kind and forgiving. And this means, verse 6, that they were not only to work while being watched as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ doing God's will from your heart. So these workers were not merely to render kind of like an eye service by working hard when they were seen. No, not just then. Instead, Paul calls them to go above and beyond the work they have been tasked with doing because by doing this, they will be acting as free agents, thus transcending their social status. Paul calls them not to try and win favor with people but instead to seek to follow Christ's example, the ultimate servant king who washed his followers' feet. Paul continues on, verses 7 and 8. He says, Serve with an, a good attitude as to the Lord and not to people, knowing that whatever good each one does, slave or free, he will receive this back from the Lord serve with a good attitude as to the Lord and not to people, knowing that whatever good each one does, slave or free, he will receive this back from the Lord. 
In other words, their service needs to be rendered with genuine goodwill because Paul actually says their service is to the Lord and not ultimately for their human masters. And even though these workers may not get what they deserve in terms of an earthly reward, they can be assured of eternal gain. And just like Jesus, Paul refers to rewards. He speaks of rewards as a result of God's grace. And so family, what does this mean for us living in Pretoria, South Africa, 2022? Well, scholars and Christians have said that it is correct to apply Paul's words here to Christians in employment. Okay? Scholars have said that it is correct to apply Paul's words here to Christians in employment. Now, maybe you have your own business. Don't worry, we're coming to you a bit later. And so whilst we, th we thankfully live in a time and a place where slavery has been abolished, the insights and the words of these verses still apply to us as Christians in employment or in volunteer work. Brother and sister in the Lord, do you know that no matter how harsh your boss your company, your manager, your supervisor is, do you know that you are free in Christ? Or do you genuinely approach work with a kind of fear and anxiety, so scared that you may do something wrong? Do you view your work as a joyful act of worship and obedience to God? Do you work hard, but only when you think it'll get you ahead or when you are being watched? And then when it's no longer beneficial for you to be seen working, you kind of slack off and let others pick up the slack. Do you only give in line with what you are compensated for? Or do you go above and beyond? Do you work so hard out of fear for disapproval at work? Do you work so hard that it's costing your relationship with the Lord? It's affecting the way that you are engaging at home and loving your neighbors? Is your relationship with the Lord and the things that he has brought across your path taking a back seat to getting ahead or getting in the good books at work? And what kind of attitude do you show up to work with? Would coworkers and colleagues consider you as, as being the salt and lights of this world? Or would they have been very surprised that you were at church this morning? Are you on time? Do you steal time? Do you steal resources? Or do you work as if working unto the Lord, certain of your coming heavenly crown? Come to verse 9, and I'll be going into verse 9, deep diving here. And this is the time that maybe you say, oh, I don't work for anyone. Well, then these, these words uh, apply to you, and they are more... They call for more from people who, who lead others. And so let's heed this warning. Masters, treat your slaves the same way without threatening them because you know that both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. Now remember, Paul here is addressing Christians in the co corporate worship gathering. Okay? He's addressing Christians in the corporate worship gathering in church some of whom had slaves because the churches in Ephesus that didn't have many people of higher social rank, but there must have been some because he wrote these words. Okay, so some of whom had slaves. Now take note, his audience is not slave owners across the Roman Empire, or else I'm convinced his message would have been harshly different. Instead, Paul here uses these words not to condone slavery, but to undermine it by speaking into it as a flawed social construct. And how does he do this? Well, he says, Masters, treat your servants in the same way that you yourselves expect to be treated. Treat your servants in the same way that you yourselves expect to be treated. And so that meant that although they made requests of their slaves, they were to make these under the authority of their heavenly master. And so now both parties, slave and master, would be seeking to do the will of God when a Christian master made a request. If a Christian master seeks to serve God, both parties, slave and master, would be seeking to do the will of God when a Christian master made a request. You see, family, vicious cruelty was rife amongst pagan slave owners, 
because these slaves had absolutely no legal rights or defenses. But now Paul says that Christian households with slaves were to show themselves to be different, treating their servants kindly, fairly, and with dignity. They were to not view themselves as better than their servants. And in fact, in keeping with the ways of God's kingdom, more was expected from Christian household masters who had more privilege, who had more resources, who had more power and responsibility. And so Christian employers, leaders, managers, team leaders, department heads, ambassador department heads, elders, deacons, friends and family at Roots of Fellowship in Pretoria 22. How are you treating those entrusted into your employment or care? How are you treating those who serve under you at work, at home, at church, and at play? How do you treat those who serve you at the restaurants, cafes, grocery stores? What about car guards, security guards, cleaners and helpers? How do you treat those who have nothing to offer you in terms of getting ahead in this life? Are you aware that God calls us to emulate Christ Christ, Jesus Christ, who had equality with God, but who laid it down and became a servant king and came to this earth. Are you aware that God calls us to emulate that Jesus? Those with more power, privilege, resources, and responsibility are expected to lay all of that down in the service of others and to the glory of God and the furthering of his kingdom. Family, if our faith in Jesus is real, it will usually prove itself in our households, in spaces where we feel most comfortable and at home and in our relationships with those closest to us and it will reveal it ourselves itself in relationships with those whom we see that we can get nothing from. And so I ask you and ask me this morning, would people in those places, at home, at work, at play, go about going, going about shopping, driving, would they see Jesus in us? Would they recognize Jesus in us? Whether we are young or old, would they recognize Jesus in you? We've seen this morning that it is not only the responsibility of parents uh, or, or kind of children's church, children's discipleship ambassadors to look after our children. It is the responsibility of us as a collective family. We've seen this morning that if we're a worker, we need to work as if we're working for Jesus Christ. And if we lead others, we are to work as if we are working for Jesus Christ under his authority. We said earlier that we are called to follow Jesus. And if we leave this place with one thing in mind, let it be that. Let's follow Jesus. Let's follow his example in our households, in the way that we love one another, in the way that we serve one another. I'm going to invite you to stand as we respond in prayer to this, to this message. And then we're going to sing in response. <clears throat> Father God, thank you that you are our perfect Father. Jesus Christ, thank you that you are our perfect Lord. We thank you that you sent Jesus as a living example for us to, to follow in all the areas and relationships of our life. We thank you, Lord God, that we are made one in Christ as your family. But Lord God, as we prepare to go out and head out into this world, as we prepare to head back to our households, I pray that this message would be real that you would remind us of who we are in Christ, that you would remind us of how we ought to live, and that you would remind us of the specific ways that we are to engage with young children, with our parents, with our elders, with those whom we serve, with those that serve us, Lord God. May we be your salt and light. May we follow you, Jesus. May we lay down our privilege, our power. May we lay it down, Lord God, and be your servant, your followers and as we do that Lord God may the name of Jesus be lifted up in our families in our workplaces in our church across the city and beyond may it be to your honor and glory in Jesus name we pray amen and amen